the battle Illuminati Says the Charlie of the Ducks Is it Disney mind control? Is this MK Ultra Deluxe? I go Disney Come to shop on a star I go Disney To no one to chat far I go Disney Pinio Land, Pinocchio I go Disney As a bomb so low Pinocchio seeks fun on Pleasure Island But traffickers need just for the mines Captain Hook the Lost Boy in Neverland Saving kids from Peter Pan's designs Nemo feels to survive the Barracuda and that nobody means no one Snow White never took another breath The Prince, the Angel of Death has come to Disney We go from real to real I go Disney Bohemian Grove and no more feel I go Disney Ask about to learn that day Go Disney, we teach a call to everybody Go Disney, go wish upon a star Go Disney, you know I'm too shall far Go Disney, the new brand Pinocchio Hey everyone, welcome to the Akat Disney Magic, where we open up the hood of the mouse and check what's in there and hope that our hands stay clean. Sorry, just trying to change it up from week to week, you know? <laughs> Not my favorite, but I, I like the variety nonetheless. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, yeah. Last time, I, I didn't want to use the word entrails this time, you know? <laughs> trying to avoid that one. This is Matt here. As always, there is the paranoid American. How's it going? Paranoid. Okay. Sounds like a paranoid day for you. We are uh, getting right through that Disney Renaissance period. I guess starting to get to the tail end of it. This one is Hercules. Um, I don't remember when I saw this first. I don't think I saw it in the theater. I think I probably saw it like 10 years after it came out. Um, and I'm not sure why. Maybe because I was 18 and trying to be smart and going to see boring French new wave films and stuff. <laughs> I hadn't seen this one. This was my first watch ever. I think. Yeah, I, I got it like maybe one of the DVD re-releases. I think I, uh, um, I think I did it before my daughter was into watching these movies. So I'm not sure we watched this one to be, be honest. Cause I just recently, you know, got it here, but, uh, I do remember kind of regretting having not seen this in the theater when I saw it. I, I do like this one pretty well. Uh, how how this one sit with you? Not one of my favorites, to be honest. I I wasn't really a huge fan of the animation and the art style. Not that it not that it was subpar. It just wasn't my thing. I, well, when I was you know looking through critical analysis and things, it seems like the art style is very divisive. So for me, I was like kind of into it, but uh, because it's kind of quirky and weird. But yeah, it seems like it, you know, maybe half the population it doesn't really land with. So uh, I I like the like the Greek um, sort of aesthetics where they would do like little swirly ears and you would see a lot of those patterns. What I didn't like was how they just kind of hammered it over the head by putting every character had like a different color. Uh, It almost reminded me of one of the newer movies where uh, i can't remember what they're called but like every different emotion gets a color it kind of reminded me of that as a way to inside just say, out inside out and it reminded me of like hey kids remember the green one's this and the purple one's this uh it had that feel to it i guess just because it is easy to get these ancient greek and roman gods kind of mixed up yeah, just as a little side note the in Japan inside out is a was released as inside head which is a more literal title, I suppose, but uh, it like sounds it weird. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, that's like the expression inside out, I guess, doesn't work uh, so much. Um, well, and also just for the Disney mind control reasons, Disney inside head just has a nice ring to it. <laughs> yeah, we're coming in there, man. This movie, um, not this movie. Excuse, well, in the wake since I've watched this movie, I've had like two notable Mandela effects. Um, one of them was Carl Weathers, who I thought had been dead for five years. Or, you know, fully proper Mandela effect. Um, I forgot he is in the Mandalorian. So. <laughs> The other one was uh, when I was doing research for this film, I, I I thought Bobcat Goldthwait had been like dead for 20 years or something. I might be mixing up with Sam Kennison, you know, as like a another screamer. But uh, yeah, I was like, oh, he's he's still kicking. Good for him. <laughs> <laughs> Who is the voice of. Oh, God, what was he doing? A uh, voice of one of the um, uh, one the, of the, the, little the demons. minions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Proto minions, I guess. <laughs> always a good minion out there this is one of those disney movies i was thinking just before i got on like ones where the occult stuff is just very much on the sleeve you know this the black cauldron sword of the stone uh sleeping beauty it's like the the purview of this podcast kind of makes perfect sense in that case but with hercules a lot of this is stories people know i mean we're taking out some adultery and stuff you know for the disney version but uh um apparently that's one of the, the big changes that of course, Zeus has Hercules out wedlock, and you couldn't have that in a Disney movie, even though you can kill the parents. But yeah, I guess the parents don't die in this movie. They're gods. <laughs> You're not wrong. Uh, most of the other movies, they leave a lot more for us to pick apart and get into. And this one's more just about, hey, let's retell the story of Hercules. Although there will be some of that because Disney, as usual, deviates pretty big from the story and i guess a lot of it is just because it might not have been as easy to sell toys and popcorn if you told the real story but like like one of the examples right is that magara in this story you know she says call me meg she's kind of you know warms up to hercules after he proves himself to be this hero and he kind of like shows virtue right but in the real story of hercules or heracles uh he's basically given Megara as an award. Like he, he wins some battle. She's given to him as a prize. They have kids like several kids. And then Hera gets upset because Hercules, like you said, was born out of wedlock and it was part of an affair. So she gets mad at Zeus and decides to make Hercules go mad and kill his wife and kids. And he goes crazy. And the the whole like 12 trials of Hercules, that's really his redemption arc as retribution to like purify his soul after having killed his wife and kids. So I would have loved to have seen that version of Disney, but for obvious reasons, they didn't do it. OK, maybe that's they're saving that for the sequel. Is that what happens in the uh, direct video Hercules? Zero it'll, to get, hero? it'll get me back into the theater if that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that'd be intense i mean you know there's so many versions of hercules a- another way i accidentally like convoluted my brain the last week was i was reading like 60s avenger comics and uh you know somewhere in issue 40 something um marvel comics hercules joins the team for five issues and there's this bizarre arc where he goes back to olympus and finds that all the gods have been like tossed into like a parallel dimension that only he can bridge or something so yeah i'm 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 getting like threads of that kind of mixed in as well. But that I guess was, I mean, what, what were the cultural, the, the main Hercules? We got Italian sword and sandals movies. We've got uh Marvel comics, Hercules, which wasn't that popular, but if you're into comics, I guess you knew him, right? Well, you're into comics. So <laughs> I would argue that he man was pretty much a modern day Hercules, uh, more or less Conan, although Conan also might have some sort of like, uh, like, you know, Scandinavian lore baked into them. But I feel like any of those just straight up warrior dudes, like if they have a huge sword and they go out and they fight animals, then they're kind of the Hercules archetype. But it, like, there's so many, we're, I guess we're just going to cut right into the, the meat here, but there's Hercules, which is the, the Roman version of Heracles, meaning I think like, um, uh, the pride of of Hera or or something like this, although that's kind of ironic because Hera, you know, basically makes Hercules go mad. But then Hercules and Heracles themselves are most likely based on an older Phoenician or Canaanite or Babylonian 
um, Melkart or MLK QRT Milkart, something like that. But he's kind of like the OG version of all of this. Yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking when you were mentioning Conan, um, you know, I was thinking like Sumerian too, and uh, drawing line all the way back to um, Gilgamesh and, and Enkidu, which is kind of like the two sides of Hercules, right? The wild man and the uh, the king or prince or whatever Gilgamesh was at the time. So, uh, but that, yeah, you draw a line from you know Samaria then into Greek and into Roman uh, versions of a uh, similar story. That the only difference is that as it go as it advances through the ages and it goes from, um, I guess like this older version of Milkart and then turns into Heracles and then turns into Hercules. Uh, they start doing less child sacrifice uh, and more animal sacrifice. Although there are a few historical records where someone's like scolding the Romans because they're they're worshiping uh, basically Melkar in the form of Hercules instead of the the better gods. And I guess the better gods were like Bacchus and a few others. I'm not really sure where the favoritism came into play, but people worshiping basically this older version of Hercules was looked down upon by this one dude. Yeah. It's Hercules. So Hercules gets praise. I, Cause I, I don't know. I always felt like he was more of our hero archetype rather than, I mean, he's supposed to be half God, right? So. Does, 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 yeah, but, but he was the, the God for anyone that was going off on some sort of an adventure. He was also the one that would uh, allow you into the city. There's some stories about Alexander the great when he went to go, I can't remember if it was Tyre. It was it was somewhere that he was trying to go in, in um, Phoenicia, and they basically didn't let him pray to this temple of Hercules or, or Melkart in that case, and that started that basically started a siege against them and the ultimate downfall over a long period of time. But uh, he was kind of the god that you would go to in order to be welcomed into any city too. Yeah, um, I, I'm always making the Japanese comparisons where. So, I, I mean, in Roman culture, I guess it was like you kind of chose your chief god. Um, Japan's kind of like you're going to go to this temple or go to the shrine and interact with whatever, you know, kami is supposed to be there. But when you're not there, you wouldn't really think about it so much. It's, it's a, I guess it's a little more like place by place. Yeah, I guess I don't have the same understanding of it, but is, does it mean like a certain spirit exists more in like a certain temple? And if you go to another temple, they're not there. Right. Like there's a temple on a mountain. The temple inhabits the spirit of that mountain. So if you're not on that mountain at that temple, why would you even think about it? You know, and it might be a place like, oh, if you're in poor health, go to this, you know, spirit will help you sort of thing. And I don't think people generally like even believe it. It's kind of just like a, you know, going. I mean, not quite going through the motions. I guess there's a reason to do it, but it's, I, I think people realize it's kind of for your own psychological benefit and not for, you know, the great beyond so much. Well, it's, you know, uh, positive thinking, right? So there, there's something to that creating your own reality. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't want to drive all the way out there just to worship the mountain God. Uh, I guess in Catholicism, I feel it's more like you go to a, like the library, you can go to any library and check out like the saint, you know? Like you can decide what saint you want to pray to when you go into wherever. Um, and you don't necessarily have to go to a specific place in order to like, you don't have to go to St. Peter's Basilica in order to pray to St. Peter, for example, you can go anywhere. Right. Whereas here, if it's an Okinawan God of, of based on an Okinawan mountain living, you know, several hundred miles away, I have no reason to even think about that. No one's going to try to make me think about that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not going to let them. Yeah. Well, there's not like, um, uh, what what do missionaries do? Proselytize. I, I'm, my vocabulary is like caving in today. Proselytize. Sorry. Yeah, that sounds right. That, that word has too many syllables. I don't like it. <laughs> All right, we're ending it here. No more. That word's gone. <laughs> Done. There we go. Um, this movie is kind of just to throw a little bit of the production thing in here. Uh, every time Muster, Muster and Clement who did beauty and the beast and little mermaid and um pocahontas like after little mermaid every time they would propose treasure planet like from the early 90s they wanted to make treasure planet which we will get to and it flopped but i I feel like people well i haven't seen it so uh i've heard people say it's actually quite good uh 
I did like Atlantis well after having not seen that for years. So but this, great. yeah. Uh, cooking around in the, in the writing rooms or the, the pitch rooms of this time was uh, they first pitched doing the Odyssey as an animation, uh, doing that as an animated movie, which seemed a little bit, I mean, that's why I think that's still unfilmable. I don't know. Could you do a prestige series on the Odyssey and have it work out? <laughs> I mean, if it wasn't suited for children, uh, with children as like the foremost audience, I think you could do it. But yeah, once you Disney dumb it down to a certain this. point, it, it loses too much of its edge. Yeah, yeah. So I think they probably realized that. Switch to Hercules, which was originally going to be um, centered around the Trojan War, where the Trojans and the Greeks were both trying to find Hercules and bring Hercules to their side as sort of a... Uh, super weapon and hercules i don't know maybe chooses the wrong side at first and and then later like you know learns his lesson and i don't remember who the correct side is who's the correct side in the trojan war i don't know um, <laughs> the winning side yeah the winning side okay yeah there is no troy anymore so uh we know who the heroes are there so i guess he would have fought for the trojans and switched to the greeks or do we go underdog i don't know i guess if it's secret weapon he has to be with the winners in the end but uh i'm sticking out for the phoenicians i think that they they can still make a comeback yeah i, th I think i'm saying here like explaining why they dropped that idea as well <laughs> just like it's kind of hard to wade those waters so we get i mean a little more of a, a simplistic story where the bad guy is now hades which i guess in greek in the greek pantheon hades isn't necessarily a bad guy but people in the 20th century watching of course are going to think hades satan so you know he's a bad guy he's the devil right well that's it exactly yeah he he's the lord of the underworld and the closest version you got to that in mainstream america is the devil so hades kind of becomes the devil they give him fire uh and they they kind of give him these little demon looking dudes you call them you know proto minions but i mean they got like little horns and and little like forked kind of tongues so they're pretty much implying that hades is some boogeyman satan in this movie right i mean i am i uh, you know i'm not like the deepest mythology guy but i feel like hades is not like a bad well he's as bad as zeus he's also horrible and yeah no he's, he's not a bad guy the way that he's portrayed here he's simply just rules the underworld but um in rome he was also given the planet pluto and he ruled over riches so he was like also the wealth guy so you didn't you didn't like look at him with disdain or with fear necessarily because he represented just a, a fact of life and plus they were like and he's the money guy see it's not all bad yeah, I do want to just look a little bit. Uh, of course, James Wood uh, did the voice who um, he I guess he's one of those, you know, older gentlemen who should probably stay off Twitter for his own good. Um, <laughs> I don't think so. I think he should. He adds a little bit of flair that it needs. Oh, he's great in this movie. I love him in this movie. I'm just talking about people complaining about him nowadays because he's on Twitter, you know. <laughs> No, and this movie is fantastic. That's the thing with James Woods. Um, I, I feel like a lot of people, I don't even know what his politics or views are because I don't care. I just know a lot of people don't like them. But I'm like, he was, he was great back in the day. And I mean, still kind of kills it when he shows up. Uh, is it Contact? He's in Contact, is he? He's horrible in that. He's great. Yeah, I mean, he's a horrible character. He's a great <laughs> actor. And that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I would love for him to redub Hercules and then redo his voice, but inject all of his politics into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah just have a nice stage for it the idea there was to be kind of a used car salesman slash hollywood agent type it's it says the original concept was for him to have a slow scary voice but as it turned out um he spoke so quickly they had trouble animating <laughs> mm. which i imagine they would have had the same problem with robin williams a few years prior but uh yeah a, a different flavor here but um it says their first choice after they got DeVito on to to be um, to, 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 to. Pan. Phil, yes, Pan. Thank you. I was going to try and say the more proper name. Let's say Pan. <laughs> oh, I have to try it. I was about to. Philosotetes? I don't know. Okay. Pan. Yes, great. <laughs> I feel uh, like we have to censor what you, whatever you just said. It didn't, <laughs> it sounded obscene. <laughs> well, fortunately, I don't put this one out with a, a, a um, clean label, so we're safe. 
Um, it said that after he cast DeVito, he was like, why don't you cast Jack Nicholson as Hades? Which would have, I think that would have been fun too. I mean, it would have been the Joker again, I guess. But uh, it, it said Nicholson demanded roughly a paycheck of 10 to 15 million plus a 50% cut of all the proceeds from Hades merchandise to which Disney's response was, we will give you half a million dollars and no merchandise. So yeah, he said no. <laughs> I feel like Jack Nicholson is still the more evil between him and James Woods. Oh yeah, yeah, and doing this role, I mean, would have been would have been great. But again, I like. I think Hades is probably the best thing about this movie. So, um, no problem. Uh, what were some other people they looked at? John Lithgow. That would have been an interesting flavor. Um, although I feel like you need his face a little bit to really get the. The Lithgow thing, though, the animator, the lead animator for Hades did say they went through a bunch of James Wood movies to make sure Hades had the correct sneer, you know, <laughs> which I, I think came across pretty well. Uh, I like just a bunch of Disney animators watching video drum. <laughs> yeah. Some other people. Phil Hartman. Love Phil Hartman. Don't think that would have worked. James Coburn. Maybe Rod Steiger. Maybe Kevin Spacey. Yeah. Always got to throw on a bit of the Spacey <laughs> there. Um, <laughs> like everyone was like up for this role. Martin Landau. Uh, In another Jerry reality, Lewis? Kevin Spacey has voiced every Disney hero and villain. That'd be great. <laughs> That's instead of doing the live action movie starting from, you know, about the time Spacey's uh, bad trip began, he just starts like redubbing all of the movies with all the princesses <laughs> now sound like Kevin Spacey. <laughs> with AI, that can happen now. Yeah. You, you've seen his yearly videos. Yeah. Let me be free. Yeah, where he basically taunts the world and is like, ha ha, I'm still free and I'm, I'm just taunting you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ultimate alpha move. Got to say, he's he's like the ultimate power move. Oh, let me be frank. Is you know one of the uh, it's got to be one of the, the the more rewatched videos on YouTube. <laughs> Pretty soon, it's just going to evolve. He's just going to be stuffing a body into a trunk and like slamming it onto the <laughs> fingers and the. I mean, he's going to be like pushing the fingers back in and just be like, "You can't get me." <laughs> I make movies in Europe now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I, I guess is what Johnny Depp's move is uh, also now. <laughs> him, him, Roman Polanski, and Depp all just start cranking out movies. Yes. Guys, you get a weird update there. Okay. So um, the music here is a, a little weird, I guess. Maybe the tank's running a little drier. Um, not bad, but Go the Distance was weird because it has two long interludes in the song that are complete scenes. It was like they weren't confident enough about the song. So it's like a verse, a complete scene, another verse, a montage, a complete scene. It was kind of weird. Yeah, this one didn't seem like... I mean, I I know I'm not the target demographic, but it didn't seem like someone you would rush out and grab the soundtrack for. Although the best music were all of the explanations. Whenever they were doing like some kind of exposition, they had like a soul group come up and they would kind of sing exactly what had happened, sort of like the start, you know, the Star Wars uh, in a galaxy far, far away. Uh, Literally the Greek that chorus. Part. <laughs> and I I like that part a lot, but it wasn't necessarily something you would sing along to. Oh no. Well, um, you, you can't sing along with like, you know, like hardcore gospel. I, I remember trying to do a gospel voice with my wife once and she's like, I'll divorce you if you ever try that again. <laughs> so uh, I won't do it now, I guess. Um, she's not in the house. She won't hear me. <laughs> but then we will lose half of the people listening to this podcast. So I will not do it. Um, <laughs> It was a weird fit, though. I mean, it, it seemed like a very 90s thing somehow, like, oh, gospel. That's kind of, you know, trend a little trendy in the 90s, I guess. Let's put it in. But it's like a then the art style is kind of like that mid-century, you know, newspaper cartoon style. And it just it didn't mesh. Maybe, maybe that's where people like it didn't like have a unified theory to the different, you know, styles, I guess. Yeah, it almost felt like like a very typical compartmentalization within Disney where one side of the studio is working on this part and other parts working on another one. It almost felt like all those interstitial scenes where you had the gospel exposition, they existed in a world outside of whoever was animating Hercules. 
Yeah. It's like, where, where would that make more sense? Um, hunchback. And now, I mean, that's because of the church, you know, that's why I'm saying they're saying hunchback. It's like gospel music, but now that I'm saying it out loud, it sounds like a bad idea as well. So, I mean, I guess this is as good a place as any, but it, it's a weird. Yeah. Fit. There's no great like Greek or Roman music per se. Like I'd ra- I guess I'd rather have gospel music than them trying to, recreate some of those older like that that was a completely different uh tonality too right oh yeah 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 different scales and things like um i mean how much of that music do we even have now do we i mean we know some of the instruments they use but i don't think we really know much of the music uh I, i've seen a no, few like in, in fact melodies. you can go online and find a lot of people doing what they call like like a uh, forever lost singing or lost greek singing where they makes some noises that i wouldn't particularly want to hear ever again uh it would probably make yoko ono's toes curl but (laughs) it's it exists and it's like a new uh way of singing they've got some instruments too that make really ugly noises but i guess in the the time period you know people really liked it a lot and aztec death whistles things like that yeah (laughs) But yeah, we I mean, we, we don't know what the music of this time was. It did not get, um, you know, uh, kept. Of course, there's no recordings. And I, I guess we don't there was no proper notation, I guess. I don't know. I, maybe people just played things at the time. So, no, I mean, there was there were scales um, that were kind of more or less ratios. But I think most of it is based on instruments that they try to recreate and then based on how they recreate the instrument they use that to derive you know what exact pitches everything was toned to but yeah i mean you're you're fudging a lot of that um for some reason you're you're talking about making the strange noises made me think yesterday i was looking at um you know bizarre jim kaziavel is that how you say his name stories where apparently um basically a lot of things i was reading were saying he's not like that sharp and when he meets people of a certain ethnicity he'll try to guess the ethnicity and then speak in their language but he's just speaking in gibberish (laughs) which is like kind of offensive and weird (laughs) but he seems to really think he's communicating in the language like he knows every language just by like by i don't know something which i know some people like that yeah so (laughs) i should try doing that more in japan you know go to a store and just start like making up what i think Maybe some Japanese words. I, I know too much Japanese already to to do that. You you have to know would, nothing. Would about they the be too? Would they off. be polite and just like play along and act like you are uh, making sense? Well, if he's number one on the call sheet on a film set and he's doing that, I guess you don't really know what to do, <laughs> which is kind of what the producers of First Adventure said. <laughs> uh, so it said they had to stop writing fight scenes for him because he would actually like attack the other actors and do it for <laughs> real. <laughs> so he's like, I need Jerry more action. Jerry yeah. Yeah. On, on set. Um, this is now, I don't know if it's on this podcast, but it's now a five timer award for me telling the story at least where apparently Jared Leto, you know, it's, it's uh, what suicide squad or whatever, where he sent people like disturbing Christmas presents, which turns out it's because he was playing the Joker uh, another actor said they worked on a, a set where Jared Leto was like something like a doctor or an office manager or something. And that year he sent everybody really nice Christmas presents. Cause that's what a doctor or office manager would do. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I have to appreciate it. it seems to go at least both ways. Yeah. <laughs> He's just really committed to the role. I, I guess when he did Requiem for a dream, he sent everyone heroin. I don't know. <laughs> Where does the cult thing factor in? Oh, I don't. Uh, this is just acting stuff. I don't know where the cult thing factors in. Yeah, what was it? Um, he he was in the when with the pandemic hit and everyone started staying home except me. Um, <laughs> he uh, apparently was off in the woods for two weeks and and the world had changed when he came back. That had to be surprising. I mean, when you when you live in a bubble, you know. Does going into the woods matter as much as just being a celebrity? I had to go to work physically like almost every day in 2020. (laughs) I got the train to myself, so that was pretty exciting. Ever do that? Just be the only person on the train? (laughs) I mean, that's when you get that that good B-roll and start selling footage um, for, you know, premium prices. 
I did shoot a video uh, for one of my songs on the train because nobody was on it. I could get away with it. <laughs> well, you know how much money it costs for, for them to shut down the roads in like New York, for example, or to just digitally remove all the traffic. But during the quarantine, you can get all sorts of B-roll of, of you know, heavy metropolitan areas and get oh, the little yeah. over shots and, and never again, right? Until they get shut down again, which is rare. Yeah, so. yeah, because now it's like, okay, we're going to clear this bridge in London for five minutes. We got five minutes to get the roll and then, then traffic's moving again. So, yeah. yeah or you just wait for a global pandemic and then get all the footage you want and then resell it for the next 20, 30 years. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, somebody had to do that. I mean, that's, you know, when everything feels like a zombie apocalypse. Yeah, let's go shoot that zombie apocalypse footage now. <laughs> Seriously, because when it clears up, that someone's going to need that footage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Eh. Oh, well, too late now. Should have had that idea, what, four years ago? <laughs> For me. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me see if I got anything else, uh, just note-wise. Oh, I definitely love Rip Torn as Zeus. Just voice wise, um, Rip Torn. Uh, my favorite moment with him is: Have you seen uh, Freddy Got Fingered? Uh, of course, yeah, Tom Green movie. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, there's a scene where he's um, doing the daddy. Would you like some sausages? Scenes and um, Rip Torn then just curb stomps the entire electric piano, and I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great movie, by the way. <laughs> it's an acquired taste. It, 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 it's a surrealism thing, I think. If you watch it as like avant-garde, then it like works really well. <laughs> Every yeah, joke is- like in, in the time period, too, of the 90s, this was like, buzz, I don't know if you remember Buzzkill and like the state, and it was sort it sort of fit into a very particular period of time where it wasn't as avant-garde as it might seem now in retrospect. I feel like <laughs> it was a little a little more on the nose uh, or maybe not. I don't know, but it, it felt like I got it at like, I don't know, 13 years old. Like it was made for me and I understood it. What I love about that is every joke is taken about 20% past where it should have gone. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, uh, that's, that's the charm of that versus, some, versus like something like Hercules where uh, everything is very much calculated on screen for, you know, maximum effect to bring in maximum audience. Right that and there's also a lot of really cheesy jokes in this one actually for whatever reason i ended up watching this one like four times wow Um, (laughs) i was i was just trying to see if there was like something i could squeeze or milk out of this uh thing and what really got me was he kept uh hades when james wood comes on he's kept dropping this stupid joke about masaka getting caught in your throat and then like waiting for someone to joke and i'm still wondering what makes that funny just because you made a reference to Greek food and it's a Greek cartoon, but everyone you're talking to is also Greek. So I don't, I don't know. It, it, it started to irritate me on the fourth time I heard it. Well, we're, could, we're talking about a multi-million dollar production here. They could have afforded to put a better joke in there. Yeah. Yeah. You think someone would catch it. I, I guess um, I, I certainly, maybe you understand more than I do ha- having uh, been in the rooms a bit, but uh just I, I, how compartmentalized is animation? I mean, you hear like, oh, this is the animator for this character. Do Is it like people work in the same room communicating or is it just go off and uh, maverick your character and then show up with it? Uh, I mean, my experience was that you would have sort of like an art lead in each different department. So they would do all of the meeting and discussing and stuff and they would basically come back with the character design sheets and maybe some treatments and storyboards. And you would just kind of work off of that under the impression that everything was, you know, going as planned, but there wasn't, there wasn't ever like a full overlap. This kind of surprised me. There wasn't a full overlap where you got to do the dailies, like on the production line, you don't get to see any of the dailies. You just kind of see what you're working on. And then you might see a slight transition from another scene that goes into yours and then yours into the next. Uh, But outside of that, I don't know if it's efficiency, if it's just discoordination, if it's sort of like a security thing to make sure no one knows what's happening with the entire movie. But my experience was incredibly compartmentalized in that case. Okay, because I'm just wondering how, you know, a a relatively poor joke would 
make it through that much vetting because you have to plan it. I mean, if I if I'm getting this correctly, if you're making animation, basically you need you're going to spend like three quarters of your time just planning to do it. And then you do it as the, the last part. Right. And that would have been in the script and then read over and approved so many different times before it got to the animation. Uh, so by the time that it's recorded and it makes it onto the animation desk, there's very low chance that they're going to be changing it. And if every time that, you know, an animator starts on something and then they say, oh, wait, we changed this line. I mean, we're talking thousands, if not tens of thousands plus of money just to make those changes, you know, to un like to just scrap whatever the animator had done and then re-record and put it back into the flow. That's a not a trivial undertaking. <laughs> And it's saying here, um, 10 minutes of the animation were Walt Disney Animation France, which maybe if you have part of it going there with maybe not, you know, I, I guess most French know English pretty well, but, you know, just a few things might slip through. It's it's on a different continent and it's uh, non-native speakers, probably. So what, 10 minutes of the movie was outsourced to France? I mean, it's still Walt Disney Animation, but yeah, I, I think that might have been around the time. Well, when did they open the second gate in Euro Disney? I, I don't remember, but uh, you know which ten minutes it was. It said mostly the finale. Okay, the, going I'm, I'm thinking the there underworld. was a really big uh, sort of discrepancy in the artwork. It, in my opinion, it didn't mesh that well when he's fighting the Hydra, uh, and the Hydra's got this like very rendered 3D look versus his more 2D look. Um, oh yeah, that's kind of mid, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's not necessarily the very end, but it is definitely one of the the climactic scenes. Oh yeah, was, uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Because I was about to say, oh yeah, well that was a finale. Oh no, it wasn't at all. <laughs> it was just a, a, a set piece. Mm, yeah, yeah, it's saying the finale. So the the uh, underworld stuff, I guess, is most of the French stuff, according to what I'm looking at. So, but yeah, hey, maybe that was too. Gets- taken into the underworld, and then Hercules has to go in, and he turns old, and then he gets young again. Yeah, I guess Inferno style. Um, that made me think of was it the 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 second level of hell? Was it the the lustful just flying around in the winds or something? <laughs> I thought that was a a decent scene, although that one uh, kind of deviates again from some of the the classic stories. But it it gives Hercules more of like that that um like christ-like complex right because now all of a sudden he's dying and coming back to life and uh yeah he's he's being all things to all people like true hercules would yeah i assumed they were just trying to like tie in just a bit of um orpheus you know (laughs) yeah just like a smattering we'll just we'll just blend everyone together here and then make zeus the least rapey he's ever been oh yeah yeah they got him making like um you know comely eyes at hair at the beginning this is definitely like zeus for kids because i i feel like you know zeus is a psychotic madman god uh you know when done correctly <laughs> well they, they kind of paint him almost like neptune right uh ariel's father in the little mermaid he's like this benevolent santa Clausy, like buff santa claus and that's sort of the feel that you get with zeus in this one too is a buff santa claus Yes, for sure. Which for me, part of the charm of Greek myths is the fact that they're all, you know, dysfunctional and amoral. You know, that's like what makes the stories interesting. Yeah, he might turn into a swan and and get a little frisky with you. And that just adds to his charm. Yes. So that's another place where I guess this. It's such an obvious occult thing, but, you know, it, it takes some of the edge off. So for me watching this, I mean, the things I like is kind of the, uh, the weird mid, you know, fifties newspaper comic, you know, Vegas, stupid razzle dazzle sort of vibe, you know, <laughs> like that appeals to me. This one, this one's interesting to me though, in a way, because if you read the original story of Heracles and understood like the the more complicated nature of it, right? Where he ends up going mad. And at the very least, there's variations in the story. Not all of them does he kill his uh, wife, but in all of them, he kills his kids because of, of Hera making him go mad. So imagine going from that story, which if you knew about the story of Hercules at all, unless it was one of like the Disney, another like the Mickey Mouse would use the retellings. Unless it was a Disney version, anything outside of that, 
you were getting a pretty adult story or at least with some adult themes bake into it. But now there's, there's generations of people that, you know, un- they think that they understand the story of Hercules, but their version of Hercules is this Disney version of Hercules, which is completely devoid of all of the, the real lessons that come along with that. Right. But it's almost like, oh, yeah, I know. I know about that. I saw that movie. Uh, and I think that Disney's been doing that for a while. Like same with the Jungle Book. Right. If you're like, oh, yeah, I, I kind of it's almost talking about the Jungle Book book. Uh, but anyone that's seen the movie probably is like, oh, yeah, I get the gist. And it's like, no, you don't, because they intentionally sat down from day one and said, let's make this different from the source material. Like, we'll take the characters, we'll take the aesthetics, we'll take little parts of the plots, but then just weave them together into a completely brand new, completely fabricated thing that's a lot easier to sell Happy Meal toys over. Which is interesting because other films, you know, we would be like, hey, they've kind of snipped in this proxy. They snipped in this other thing and the more original things. But if you take like an existing thing, it, well, Jungle Book has those Disney proxies. It's still there, but it's, you know, it's a different flavor than the book and a different narrative in the book, really. So, well, And this one does have that same Disney proxy where you've got uh, Her- Hercules, who's sort of kicked out of the heavens are out of Olympia. And then they, he's got these, you know, these proto minions, these little demons that are trying to kill him the whole time, but he gets raised as an orphan. And then he finds out that he's been estranged from his, these parents, you know, these gods out in the sky. So again, we've got that orphan story. Although this one, it's kind of appropriate because it's the actual background. It's not like Disney decided to sneak that one in there. Um, right. So, well, it's kind of like he has two sets of parents because Zeus and Hera actually like him in this movie, whereas you feel like in the original myths they, you know, couldn't care. Well, too Hera much less. definitely not. Which again is it's it's oh yeah, she his don't name like is, this guy Heracles, but <laughs> Hera is not a fan. Maybe that was a way to try and uh, make her a little happier that he'd been right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I named her after you, honey. See, it's <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of like these... your kid now. <laughs> yeah, so now we have these weirdly loving parents that don't die because they're gods. And I get well, well, I don't know. I guess they can. No, they can get what uh, imprisoned by the Titans or whatever. I don't know. But um, yeah, we have those. And then the other set of parents, uh, his his adopted parents. Uh, they're. I mean, he leaves them, but that's a choice he makes, I guess, as he's coming of age. So uh, there, there is definitely less of the parent stuff in this movie than Disney usually goes for, even even if there is a separation. Yeah, they're like the Kents, you know, like the like Her- Hercules is Superman. Literally, he's Superman, and his adopted parents are just the Kents. Yeah, I mean that that's pretty much what the story is, isn't it? <laughs> I mean. The- uh, I think, in my opinion, Hercules is the the most persistent superhero story of all time. And again, Hercules, Heracles, Melkart, it, it probably keeps going back further than that one. But these these three in particular, the Hercules and Heracles is basically the same character. Uh, there's a very small changes between them when they made Hercules to kind of fit into uh, like Roman culture. And then Melkart he kind of has a much like just as strong of a connection, but slightly more removed just because of the name essentially. But he went through all the same trials and tribulations outside of killing Megara, uh, fighting with lions and wearing the skin and all of like the entire story from beginning to start. So I, I really do think that this is like the, the prototypical superhero story. Like any kid that ever had an action figure, it kind of boils down to Hercules and they've got old versions um, that they, they found of like Toffets and uh, other sort of little statues and figurines that you'd keep in the house of Hercules. So, I mean, this was like the OG He-Man. And we're going to get him again uh, several movies down the line when we get to The Incredibles and we get Mr. Incredible, you know. Actually, Mr. Incredible was the title in Japan. So, <laughs> Incredible Zoo, I guess it didn't work in Japanese. I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, we're going to... That's that's kind of like this, the nice sequel to this, as opposed to the one where he goes mad and kills his family. You know, like the Incredibles is like Hercules down the line. Now he has a nice family, blah, blah, you know? Yeah, but I mean, that's that's the real redemption arc. Like there's no real um, redemption arc of any kind in this. And if, if you look at it in this entire movie, right, uh, he doesn't necessarily change a whole lot like his character development. 
he kind of starts out and the only thing is that he realizes that his his dad's a god and he wants to go back and rejoin but none of that happens um and all he ever does is just kind of finds out that he's strong but he kind of knows that he's strong from the very beginning i don't know it's a really it's an odd story without letting him kill his family and then make up for it and purify himself. Like that's the whole entire story of Hercules. Well, this is the Superman two arc where, you know, uh, Superman temper thinks he's permanently giving up his powers and then they just kind of come back anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's more or less where we are here. So, was yeah, because oh, even, you- even when he goes all the way into the underworld and they're all like, Oh, you can make him mortal. Uh, like, it makes you think that he's going to be able to die and then they can't cut his strand, right? The thing that's keeping him alive, this, this uh, strand of life. So same kind of deal. Like he was, he was never going to die. There was never a chance he was going to die here. So, um, yeah, I was having trouble working out what would be the message of this movie in general. Uh, so you, you, you said you watched it four times almost. So, uh, what did you come out with? What's what's under the surface? Uh, the message is that Pan's a horny little dude that will sleep with anyone. Uh, and I guess that's just like Danny DeVito straight up. Yeah, as well say it's like Danny DeVito. <laughs> but yeah, the, the story of Hercules was, uh, I don't know, like self-empowerment. You're stronger than you think you are. Although it's it's kind of weak in my mind, the Disney version of it. Because, again, it starts out with showing him he's so freaking strong and he doesn't know how strong he is. So the character development is that he figures out, hey, I'm strong. Just back on Pan, my note I just found here was it's no great leap that the satyr is a sex pest. Okay. (laughs) And he doesn't like animals in this movie. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess this is this the horniest. No, nah, the horniest I get is um is Simba and, and what's her name of the Lion King, isn't it? <laughs> and, and Pegasus too. They they kind of skip over in this movie. Zeus creates Pegasus out of a cloud and he gives them to Hercules as a baby. And it's you know it's like a cute little My Little Pony style Pegasus. But the real Pegasus, I believe, was created from the blood of Medusa, which again would have been a way cooler intro for Pegasus. But I believe Clash of the Titans reasons. does that. <laughs> I mean, this, in my opinion, those are what makes these stories timeless is the, the over the top violence. And this Hercules, you know, thank God that Walt Disney uh, company was not in charge of writing the original stories. <laughs> uh, uh, just as a random note here, I'm, I'm noting I have some notes here about the, the sundial guy. There's the sun dials in his jacket. I'm wondering how he manages not to impale himself multiple times. You remember that guy? Oh, and speaking of impaling uh, yourself, even there's there's a reference to suicide in this movie, which is interesting for a Disney one and a direct reference to infant infanticide, which I think are two fairly rare, you know, Pokemons to find inside of a Disney movie. Like these are two of the rarest hidden Mickey's. That one yeah, of them is when I, Zeus is like, I kill myself, and Hades is like, you know, oh, I, I wish, or something like that. That was actually one thing I was kind of thinking about here, because uh, Hades is basically dispatched at the end, but isn't, you know, in the terms of, of the Greek pantheon, haven't we just disrupted the cosmic balance if we no longer have a Hades? <laughs> you can't just dispatch him. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he's he's there to keep people dead. I, I guess that's maybe what Disney's kind of missing here and, and why you don't want them writing the original stories because he's saying, that, oh, yeah, the gods were amoral, did horrible things all the time, but they all have to balance each other, you know? Um, the Asgardians as well, that none of them can really die because their balance is keeping reality together, more or less. Yo, I guess that's probably the part where um, the Disney analogy here breaks down on their side because they paint him as this evil satanic being that now all of a sudden he doesn't fulfill that that like balanced role that he has to fill. And they really hammered in, too, because he even tells his little proto minions, like, remind me to maim you later. Like, like he's legitimately planning on torturing people like he is he is as satanic as you can get in a biblical sense 
so the like you know it seems lopsided and you can't just kick him out but if he's Satan, then you kind of can. I don't know. It's it's weird to to like angelicize so much of this particular story out of all the stories that they could have, you know, kind of like Christianized. This one seems the least appropriate, but it gets the the most treatment that way. What what Greek tale? So again, they were first looking at um the odyssey and then you know rewound i guess back to kind of the iliad plus hercules um what would have been the the best thing for disney to do if you if you were consult uh you know consulting them about this uh what would, would this would this would be uh zeus falling in love with a prepubescent boy and going down <laughs> to earth as an eagle and snatching him up uh i'd probably have him do that one yeah, they'd already made Sword in the Stone, though. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we've already got this one. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if you could Jason and the Argonaut it, okay? Because that's kind of just like a more of, I mean, there's the Golden Fleece. There's a lot of meaning there. But there's also kind of like just, um, ser- not serial, like kind of episodic adventures there that you could animate. I would love the Eleusinian Mysteries, too. That would be a really good one with Demeter and... um like going through the entire process, I guess. I see. That's where I think I, I like an odyssey is like, well, you'd probably want to make that for adults. And at this, at this moment in time, at least you'd like prestige TV miniseries. It, you know, I, I think Dis- Disney could make a revival. If they go back to their roots and say, we're going back to grim, but we're going to keep it grim. I don't know. I feel like if, cause if they beat other people to the punch, like if, if you could see, who and honey is that? Was that the name of it? Blood it was, uh, and honey. Blood and honey. Who and honey would have been better, <laughs> either way. Or blo- bloody poo, poo and blood. Anyway, uh, blood and honey. So imagine if you found out there was a Disney for like the official Disney version of that coming out. Now all of a sudden, I don't know. I f- I feel like that would make them money, and they could just release it under Touchstone or whatever the hell they've got these days for that. Could they properly subvert themselves, though? I feel like a, a third party really has to do that, which Blood and Honey was the wrong third and par- uh, third party to do it. But I feel like they couldn't come from like in company so well. Uh, when, when does a massive force like that properly satirize themselves? Because uh, another Disney you know, venue, Marvel, I mean, they do like Guardians holiday special, but it doesn't really attack the brand itself. It's just like goofy. Whereas I think what you're talking about is kind of like really disassembling and deconstructing the brand a bit. I mean, yeah, I guess it say, reminds right? me of like the pulled SNL skits where they would attack, you know, like the higher ups and it would air the one night and then get taken out of all the repeats. Right, right. There's some South Park episodes I believe that happened with. So, <laughs> yeah, the the OG a lot, um, a lot episode, right? Or uh, what's what's the dude's name? You're not allowed to draw his face. Muhammad. Muhammad. Are you even allowed yeah, to yeah. say his name? Do we have to censor that? No, you can say his name. You just can't <laughs> visually represent him. And uh <laughs> You know, I'm like thinking an, of a picture of him right now. Stop me. That's a mental you'd have to draw it and then hold it to the screen to to really anger them. All right, now you're just trying to get me killed. <laughs> you're in Japan. You don't have to worry about this kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, good point. But uh yeah, where were we? Uh doing that. I, it was funny. Uh, with, around the time Mission Impossible Three came out, Tom Cruise tried to have that done with the Trapped in the Closet episode, but he failed. But by that point, you know, Cruise's star powers, I guess, at its, its weak point at that part in, point in time. So they told him to piss off. <laughs> the comedy this, powers. I can't be, remember when the was it the second scary movie came out, and I think Owen Benjamin made fun of him jumping on the couch in front of Oprah. Uh, I feel like that was kind of the the main declining point of Tom Cruise's like staying power, or at least yeah. until he sends the Scientology goons after you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, so this was that time period. He tried to get a South Park censored and uh, failed a bit at that. So, uh, have you ever seen? Um, it's like a Scientology promo video from like 15 years ago with him. It has got um, uh, yeah. Well, it, it's the one that he's got that black turtleneck, and they're all talking about um, like all the magical powers you can get. 
Well, I love it because it's got one fake Mission Impossible music behind him. Yes. And two, every time he's like, you know, if you really need to, you feel like you really need to help people because cut. <laughs> like he never finishes a thought in the entire thing, <laughs> which I find really entertaining. <laughs> but he's so intense and never finishes his thought. <laughs> Are we saying that Tom Cruise is the modern day Hercules? May, old man Hercules, sure. Is, that's his stick now. I'm gonna. I'm 62. I'm gonna go out and do an insane stunt anyway. I don't care. I'm going to I mean, space. And there, there might be people sacrificing their children to him. It's hard to tell. Possibly. Who knows what goes on behind closed doors of organizations? <laughs> uh, and I'm curious. I'm not. Too. I'm not I pointing out any specific it. organization. <laughs> is Tom Cruise associated with any big uh, Disney movies? I don't he I don't think he's ever done voiceover work. Um I might be forgetting something. I mean he hitched up to Universal. They were gonna do their dark universe thing and they made the mummy and then like, yeah, nah, we'll just call that the new land in the theme park instead. That could have been something. It could have been something, girl, but they screwed that one up. So yeah, because he he hitched up with Universal. Um he was he was Paramount's guy for so long. Um there was a the I think he was kind of independent around the time of Valkyrie or whatever, but I don't, yeah, I don't think he's had much to do with Disney come to think of it. He, in 1986, he was in the color of movie, uh, the color of money touchstone. And then in 88, he was in cocktail touchstone. So that is the most recent and closest brushes with Disney that Tom Cruise has had. I mean, I think his brand's too strong to fit inside Disney, you know? He's got his own like thing going on. <laughs> he he needs his sideman. I mean, that's what's happened with uh, Christopher uh, McQuarrie. Uh, McQuarrie. I'm not quite sure how you say it, but eh, he's going to direct all my movies now. So he's got so his I, own. I think that, that this particular movie could do with the remake. I think Hercules could have a successful remake just because the first one as far as I'm aware, isn't like incredibly coveted or loved the same way that some of the other ones are. I think it's one that people have gone back to a little bit and been like, Hey, this is better. Than I thought it was, uh, that said, I was surprised. I was like, yeah, hunchback actually was a better movie, which I thought it was going to be the other way around. <laughs> this one wasn't impressive to me visually. I don't think it had the same amount of care put into uh the backgrounds the transitions even matching the 3d with the 2d uh, a lot of that again this felt the most compartmentalized so far out of i guess the renaissance movies do you yeah. know was this one planned to be the big the big one or was oh, this a yeah B? no this is a this is musker clements directing that means it's a uh they had a massive Times square parade and premiere for this movie that they spent something some insane amount i i, I want to say 10 million but i'm just kind of pulling that out of my my head uh so that might not be right but yeah they had kind of like the pinocchio thing I, I don't think they had drunk little people at this one but uh hey they should have they could have been pans <laughs> yeah i mean the the early days of disney would have been so much more wild man because they were just trying stuff out for the first time on a lot of those things and at this point, we've got corporate Disney. I feel like Her Hercules and even like the, the three or four that came before this one are, you know, the pinnacle of, of corporate Disney. Yeah. Um, everything here we go. Done by the book. On June 14th, the premiere of the film was accompanied with a Hercules led performance of Disneyland's Main Street Electrical Parade held in Times Square. So they shipped all of the floats to Times Square. Mm -hmm. To, to do the Hercules premiere, which I'm sure that costs some money. Um, broadcast live on the Disney Channel. Traveled from 42nd Street to 5th Avenue. Attendees included Harvey Keitel, Andy Garcia, Barbara Waters, Michael Bolton, and Mary Lou Henner. Sorry, I was trying to do it Saturday Night Live style. <laughs> was Michael Bolton in this movie with music? I think he was, was there. He, he was just there to promote it. Yeah, I think he's just star power. I mean, I'm, okay. I'm checking if he, uh, I mean, Harvey Keitel wasn't in it. I can tell you that. 
Mary Lou Henner, I don't think, was here. Uh, oh, 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 oh. Michael Bolton sings the single version of Go to the Distance, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> So when did, did I think Michael, Hercules, I don't think Michael Bolton, but that's fine. Come on, yeah, that hair in the nineties. I guess Fabio he, he was just—he was never he, an intimidating man. You can see him hanging out with the Kevin Sorbo Hercules, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. Now that's a story arc that I want to get into. The, Ke- the Kevin <laughs> Sorbo Hercules definitely would have been the Christian version. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that one was also, everyone was like, oh, Xena's better. Uh, for me, uh, at that point, I, I had found, you know, I was a teenager and I, I had better things to do on Sunday afternoon. If I had been like three years younger, I'm sure I would have seen every episode of both. But uh, if you're in the house on Sunday afternoon and you're 17 or something, you, you've lost, you know? <laughs> and I remember the um, the one that I saw the most of because it came on at, I don't know, like 3 or 4 a.m., was Andromeda, and that was basically just Hercules in space. Yeah, I'd never seen that one, which, you know, being a unrepentant Trekkie, maybe I should have seen at least two episodes of it. I'm looking if, for... If you uh, ever want to get your fill of... of uh, I don't know if I would quite consider it Star Trekkie, but if you want to get your sci-fi on and get your Kevin Sorbo on, it's the literally the only option you have. There we go. For some reason, I just find um, Kevin Sorbo's because re- he basically he does like Christian funded movies now. Am I correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So when you look at the name of his characters over the past few years, I just find it weirdly, mildly entertaining. What do we have? President of the United States and Alien Storm. Rayford Steele, Dr. David Riley himself, King Herod, Doc Boy, Dr. Soul Harkins, Parley Condi. I don't know why. I just find that funny. <laughs> It's just so weirdly, like, not quite generic names. It's like 2% from generic. (laughs) Yeah, no, he's got like a pantheon of of his own gods that he gets to jump between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I I guess if, you know, you find your niche. My favorite, of course, is Adam Sandler, who just seems to use making movies as an excuse to take his friends on a vacation somewhere. So I appreciate that. We're going to Hawaii for a month, folks. No, we didn't make a good movie. It made enough money. We'll make another one. That's, that's, I don't know. It's not artistic, but. Seems like a fine way to live your life. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? There's something to be said about those movies that you can just put on in the background and not have to care about what's going on, but also it be entertaining enough and have uh, familiar enough voices that it's like pleasant. I think that there's like that's its own art form in a way. The phone movie, the movie you can have on and do something on your phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think that you can make those and like cater to that particular. Or to, I don't know. You can cater to that. No, when, when you know, I have like different movies I watch at different rates. Like, obviously, Hercules was active watching. It's on my screen. I'm taking notes. I'm occasionally pausing, maybe rewinding in a few spots. Uh, we were talking cruise. I've just been I'm been rocking through the Mission Impossibles recently, and those are are nighttime movies. Uh, I'll I'll watch ten minutes, probably fade out through ten minutes, and just kind of find a place to start it again. You know, I don't remember where I fell asleep. <laughs> I got to say, most of the movies that we've seen recently, I usually watch them at like one and a half or even two speed if I can handle it. But Hercules, even though I watched it four times, I don't think I watched it on speed because uh, there's enough going on to keep it interesting. Even it's like an hour and a half. It seems kind of long, but I feel like the pacing's pretty decent. Like, Like things happen, even if it doesn't look as nice. Yeah, I was watching on, on Blu-ray, so I couldn't really speed up, at least without losing the sound. So um, we we delayed the recording, so I did watch it at proper speed. But I was like sitting there like last week, uh, me also like kind of scrambling to finish it. So it's probably good that we we both had some time to stew on it a bit. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to give this one its you know due because, like you said, the occultism is sort of right on the sleeve on this one, just because it's about ancient mythology. Uh, you know, on a technicality, it's about ancient mythology. Like they use some of the same plots and the characters, but again, this is typical Disney deviating as far as they can, just so that they can sell you happy meal toys. Uh, do you have any rabbit holes in your notes? We haven't touched on. Uh, I mean, I guess a lot of them are just 
uh, generic to Hercules in general, but for example, the the twelve labors of Hercules is a procession through the zodiac. So if you're not familiar with that, I'm not going to go through every single one of those. But like he fights the the Namian lion, and this him fighting the lion, this is that one of the the more consistent correlations that he's got with Melkart. Melkart has this exact same thing, and this kind of represents the constellation Leo. The same, and I think the same way that Melkart perhaps did. Like I think Melkart also likely represented the zodiac in a different way, and it just that's the part that really sticks and is important, and that's the reason why the story keeps continuing. Um, there's that version. He fights a bull. The bull is Taurus. Uh, when he fights the Hydra, the Hydra is Cancer. Um, he ends up fighting birds. Uh, which through a, a convoluted reason ends up being Sagittarius. Uh, it's because of where the constellations are actually at in the sky on this one. He goes to Scorpius and Lupus when he fights Cerebrus. So all the, and Cerebrus is like one of those classic characters that we see in all sorts of uh, movies now, right? The, the, like the three headed dog from hell another one that gets the same connotation as being like a guardian of this satanic hell versus um you know kind of just being the, the guardians of the underworld so and then he cleans out the stables uh which is aquarius so i always thought that one was really interesting and then some of those things with him like slaughtering the bull for example i think you can also correlate to like the cult of mithras and where they would slaughter the bull, which was also like an astrological procession. You'd have the dog nipping at the feet. You'd have the scorpion down there. So I'm the most fascinated, really, when you when you dial it back and you look at either the Zodiac connections and then again, that that Phoenician or Carthaginian Melkart. I think that there's so much more to the Melkart connection. Uh, so if anyone's interested at all in Heracles and Hercules, look in the Melkart. What, why are you saying that? I was just sitting here thinking, like, just being America and having the kind of, you know, Anglo sort of Christian viewpoint. I was like, well, what what would have made a little more sense? And and the things that just popped in my head while you were saying that were um, when uh, St. George and the Dragon, you could do something similar to this with that. And it would maybe fit the source material. They could stick to it like a little better. I mean, they had Puff the Magic Dragon, and they had uh, uh, what was the other crappier Disney dragon movie? Peace Dragon. Peace, Peace Dragon. I can't remember which one was was the good or the bad one. I guess they were both not great. I think there's one in the '40s. Was that a dragon? Uh, no. Yes, I don't remember. Um, yeah, I'm just uh, thinking the the more. I mean, Greek culture is Western culture, but the religion isn't. You know, so that's kind of where I'm 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 getting at. Um, well, it, it morphs, right? Because it start like it started uh, Sumerian, Canaanite, Babylonian, whatever. It starts there, then it turns Greek, and then it turns Roman uh, as the Romans just continue to dominate. But they just sort of ad- adopt everything because the Roman Empire was just sort of this, I guess, the closest version to a melting pot that we had in the the old age. So they kind of just took all these different bits and pieces, very Hellenistic fashion. So we've like the version that we have now, in my opinion, the version like what do we have of Jesus, for example, he's got all of these heroes wrapped up into him. He's got Hercules in there. He's got a little dash of Heracles, a little dash of Melkar, all of them. That was the other analogy I was about to make. Uh, I grew up, my parents go to like a Episcopal church, which is like, um, you know, I guess Catholicism for people that don't want to have guilt complexes. But, uh, you know, at Easter, they do the stations of the cross which is going to 12 like walking around the church and telling a bit of the story mm-hmm. at 12 different stations also made me think about hercules thinking about the zodiac and and just like you know christmas used to be saturnalia so it's like well let's take these trials and uh we're gonna paste them onto you know jesus instead which he's not I fighting I mean, I don't dragons think it's heretical. But... i think it makes plenty of sense it just it takes the same stories that have worked for people for as long as we've got written history of and then just keep telling the same story but you gotta you gotta keep ad- adopting it and and you know making it newer with the times like pretty soon uh jesus is gonna is gonna be wearing like skinny jeans i'm pretty sure yeah 
anyway, so I guess that way you could say the Passion of the Christ for a second Jim Casiavel reference would, would be a, a good Hercules movie. <laughs> has, has he worked himself out of the possibility of ever doing a Disney movie? Or do you think that he has a, a redemption arc too back into Disney? Oh, uh, who? Jim Cavazil. Yeah, sorry, I can't say his name right. Um, was, was he actually working for Disney? No, but I'm just, I think that, that he's gone uh, on to a little bit of a a limb. Uh, you know, he took a little fork in the road to where he, it might be almost persona non grata, like Mel Gibson light in a way, not because he yeah. did anything wrong, but just because he's associating with, uh, you know, Mel Gibson-esque. Yeah, and there's other other actors who are kind of like... I. <sighs> they kind of got shoved out for reasons that you never quite heard about. Um, like Janine Garofalo is never canceled, but she was very vocal against the Iraq war in 2003. And then her career ended. Um, John Cusack got very into talking about the Palestinian uh, rights 10 years ago. And have you seen him in a movie recently? <laughs> well, and I'm looking at uh, Mel Gibson actually did the voice for John Smith uh, in Pocahontas. Right, right. Oh yeah, I so, dropped that one on you right at the end of that podcast. Right, so he, so he does have Disney canon for being a voiceover, and then Apocalypto, I guess, was Touchstone. So that was also technically a Disney movie. Honestly, I think Mel is about where he is now, where he would have been if he had never, you know, gone on drunken rants. Like he wouldn't be a. I, I think now he, he makes a few movies. He's a character actor here and there. He gets some work. Um, I, I, I and it was a build up, I guess, in this case, from uh, getting quote unquote canceled. Uh, I think it would have been a slow decline or chilling out, if you want to be nice. Uh, I think he'd be in the same place now that he would have been anyway. <laughs> so I want to believe this is true. I uh, have a pretty strong feeling it was just a rumor, but I read it on like multiple places online so that means it has to be a little little bit true but mm-hmm. that mel gibson was planning on making a rothschild movie and man i would give anything to see like a true mel gibson written produced directed movie about the rothschilds like a three when hour was epic. He, when was he working on that for the, i remember the uh the articles i was reading was probably around like 2007 2008 so there's yeah, a good chance okay. that it's, it's not happening because it probably would have happened by now if that were the case. No, that, that starts making you wonder if he had, you know, perhaps been set up a bit uh, at that time because that's about the time of his meltdown, isn't it? Well, and what was the only other movie about the Rothschilds is the House of Rothschild from like hell, like the 30s or the 40s or something, right? Like we're overdue yeah. for another Rothschild movie and it would have been awesome for it to be mel gibson it would be even better if there was a walt disney rothschilds movie there was a tv show a few years ago i think that was oh god what was it um they had a family similar to that called called rittenhouse i think which i didn't really see the show i just clocked it because that's my grandmother's maiden name so obviously i was like whoa but they had like that kind of family and just changed the name a little bit hmm. teaching but, uh, themselves their own language yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, just I was like, hey, that's a, that name's in my family. So maybe, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't, I don't know of our, our unbelievable funds and riches and, you know, um, privileges. So you have a, a, a witty exit line for us that's going to be on theme for Hercules? Hercules, Hercules. I was just going to shout it like, you know, Nutty Professor, right? <laughs> Hercules, Hercules. There you go. That sounds better. Um, uh, I, I can try thinking of another one, but if we're at the end of the road here, uh, you want to tell folks what's doing in your brew? Uh, yeah. So the big one now is paranoidsummer.com. This is going to be a release of four different brand new comic series, all number one issues, and they're all going to release at the same time. Hence the name Paranoid Summer. It'll probably be shipping sometime around summer. But as soon as I've got 100 people signed up on that link, ParanoidSummer.com, I'll release that campaign. So uh, rain or shine, this is how I'm getting the next four big issues out. And it'll probably be the only time that you'll be able to get some exclusive backer-only covers for these number one issues. So they are guaranteed 
to be worth in the millions within a hundred years from now. Guaranteed. You can come after me uh, in a hundred years from now if they have not broken a million dollars, but I'm positive that they will. Hopefully it, it has. This is investment copies. advice, by the way, that was absolutely investment advice Buy paranoid American comics as investments. They will make you a millionaire. Although in the distant future, a million dollars won't be able to get you eggs, but that's beside the point. <laughs> and it'll still be far more valuable than that early 90s X-Men number one. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, as for me, I do a lot of podcasting. I talk about The Twilight Zone. I talk about really good movies and really bad movies. I talk about Space 1999. That's all at the Patreon podcastio podcastius if you want to dig into that. Um, I, I didn't make a witty one-liner for you, but I definitely, I have a note here, which was the most incredulous thing I, I found in the entire movie. So I could end with that. Let's hear it. Hercules wants to escape the orgy that's just starting. Not very Greek of him. Chosenland.com Go visit Chosenland.com It's easy to remember If you just sing along Chosenland.com Go visit Chosenland.com The Chosen One Yes, he is the Chosen One He's got his own comic And now he's got his own song Cause he's the Chosen One Yes, he is the Chosen One Go buy a copy at Chosenone.com Chosenone.com Go visit chosenone.com It's easy to remember If you just sing along Chosenone.com Go visit chosenone.com 